Welcome to a large model showman's engine. This is part 13 and in this episode I will be repairing the paintwork and lining and I will also be making a link clevis for the regulator extension. This quite obviously is the flywheel and the paintwork around the edge of it was very badly damaged. The paint was so badly damaged that I removed it in a previous episode. The paintwork on the flywheel was also damaged around the inside edge. Repairing the paintwork in this area is proving to be more difficult than I first thought. Initially I removed the loose flaking paint and then I used a thin skin of cellulose stopper or cellulose putty to fill in the blemishes where I removed the paint. And that's when the problem began. It was okay applying the putty but when I came to rub it down it was apparent that I hadn't really got all of the loose paint off. Over the last few days it's been a sequence of apply cellulose putty, wait a day or so until it sets and start to rub it down. First of all using coarse emery cloth, followed by using 400 grit wet to dry sandpaper and during this cycle of applying the putty and sanding it down it soon became apparent that some of the paintwork underneath the putty wasn't firmly stuck to the metal and started to flake off. And when that happened I helped it along with a screwdriver point making sure that I got rid of every trace of loose paint and then as you see here I applied some more cellulose putty. Because this area is curved I found the best tool to use for applying the cellulose putty was my finger and using your finger for this job is possibly not a good health and safety idea. Here you see me wiping off the surplus using a cloth. And that's all I could do on the flywheel now I have to wait until the cellulose putty has dried. Time now to repair some of the lining which is damaged. And the first thing to do is to mix the paint to match the colour that's already on the engine. For the thick lining, which is in a sort of a orangey, pinky, lobster colour, I'm mixing Phoenix Precision Paints BR Signal Yellow with some Buffer Beam Red. And the best way to check the match is to just apply some over the original lining. I'm illustrating this using the lining on the belly tank, which is basically okay. The idea being, apply some of the colour that I'm mixing over the original paint and see how close it is. From a colour match point of view, this one was quite close, it just needed a little bit more buffer beam red. The new paint is obviously wet and it dries back a little darker than this. So I think that will do for the job that I want it for. Behind the engine, right at the back of the bunker tank, is a very badly damaged area of the paintwork. I repaired the paintwork using cellulose stopper, so the repaint of the crimson lake colour is fine. I used two pieces of masking tape, so I got a nice straight edge. I let the paint dry for a while and then quickly gave it another coat, then I removed the masking tape. And once this paint is thoroughly dried, I'll mask it up again to paint the yellow lines. Over now to the lathe. First of all, I machine a piece of phosphor bronze. I drill a hole down the centre which is 9 30 seconds of an inch in diameter, tapping size for 5 16 by 32 threads per inch. Over now to the rotary table on the milling machine, and I have a slot drill fitted. This is a two blade, very sharp milling cutter. In the first part of this sequence, I'm going to show what happens if you do this wrong. You will notice that I'm not supporting much of this in the three jaw chuck, too much of it is stuck out. It's okay for a light cut, but when I increase the depth of cut, watch what happens. The first cut was a very light cut, so nothing happened at all other than a slot started to appear in the top of the work. When I use a milling machine, generally speaking, I take too deep a cut. So I've set it to take a substantial cut, and now watch what happens. Oh dear, disaster. Well not really, I did this on purpose. I just put the part back in the chuck and as I left it oversized for the demonstration I just machined it to the finished size and it's okay. To speed up this process, which is a very slow and tedious process, I've speeded up the video. It's running at 800% or 8 times normal speed. I need to cut a very deep slot down the middle of this component. And in my small home workshop type milling machine, this takes a long time to do. And that's why right from the outset it's vital to make sure that the work is supported correctly in the three jaw chuck. If the part jumped out of the chuck at this stage, it would be scrap. 
Looking at the job, the slot in the part seems to be about the right depth. I'll just check it for width. This is the regulator extension handle and it's a good fit in there. For cutting the slot, I set the rotary table to zero degrees. And here I'm machining the first of the outer dimensions. How much do I need to take off? Well, I don't really know yet. But the good thing about using a rotary table for this job means that when I turn the part round, I can take the same amount off the other side. In this part of the clip, the rotary table is set to 90 degrees and I'm machining one of the edges that has the slot in it, so I'm being a little bit more careful here. The good thing is this milling cutter is a new one and it's very sharp indeed. My milling machine is nothing to write home about, it's quite a primitive, very old thing. And when it's running, it's a bit on the rattly side. Although, if I'm honest, most of this rattling comes from the cover that covers the pulleys. Now I've set the rotary table to 180 degrees and I'm machining the other side. Currently I'm removing just enough metal to get rid of the rounded edges of the round bar. When this is finished it will not be perfectly square, it will be rectangular. I've now set the rotary table to 270 degrees and I'm doing the other side where the slot is. A rotary table for me is a fairly recent acquisition in the last few years. No, that's a lie. When I think about it, I did have a rotary table for quite a few years, but I never had a chuck for it. In this clip, I've wound in the handle on the milling table to remove more metal from the slot side. The reason for doing this at both sides, as you can see, I'm winding the rotary table to the other side, is so that this clevis has some up and down movement. Because the extension handle describes an arc, this link needs to be free to move to accommodate the fact that the extension handle will move up and down as it's moved backwards and forwards. Coming up very shortly, there will be another episode showing the completed regulated extension system. Once I'd finished the milling operation, I put the part back in the lathe to remove the flange at the bottom of the main clevis, and then I drilled a 7 seconds of an inch hole all the way through the clevis. Then I enlarged one of the holes to quarter of an inch diameter at one side only, and threaded the other side quarter BSF. I didn't really need to do this, but I was in play about with quarter BSF nuts and bolts mode. After this drilling operation, it's clean up time. First of all, with a needle file to remove the rough finish and all the burrs. You don't have to do this, but it looks a lot better for it. I really have a dislike for engines that are built using what I term the hammer and file method. I like to polish up the parts and make them look something. My principle is that every part of the engine should be a small model in itself, and as this engine is so well made, the least I can do is try to continue the same quality that was created in this engine by the original builder. Here you see the finished component, and the good thing is it swivels. That's why I machined two of the sides a bit more than the rest. Most of the showman's engines that I've seen, and that includes the small one and a half inch scale model that I also have, are fitted with side plates that covers up the motion and stops people putting their arms in there. I'm going to make some side plates for this engine and they're a bit fiddly to make and a bit fiddly to fit, so I'm taking no chances and making a cardboard template first. And as part of the design, I need these plates to be quickly removable to work on the motion if necessary. Once I've cut a cardboard template and fitted it to the other side, I will then remove both of the templates and measure them, so then I can order some brass sheet and some thicker brass strips from Blackgates Engineering. And for now, that's it for this episode. I'd just like to say in these strange times, stay safe, stay well. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Main Steam Models website, and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back, making it unnecessary to comment that the videos are too short.